Mind Crime Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss, would megacorps dominate in Ankapistan? So, what what do I mean here? Well, megacorps are kind of an ill-defined term. Very large corporations. Uh, probably the best measure of a size of a corporation is its revenue. So you could think of firms like Walmart, I suppose Amazon, Apple. These big firms with huge uh, revenues and are, are globally dominant in their fields. Those are basically you could consider the megacorps and, of course, the banks as well. What is Ankapistan? Well, it's kind of the world of anarcho-capitalism. Now, this could be many, many different things, but for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to accuse it sort of a Rothbardian utopia. Uh, by utopia, I just mean that the society broadly conforms to Rothbardian ethics, and there is free competition amongst the provision of um, judicial services in case of disputes. Um, so the argument tends to be if you have from various critics, criti um, various critics of the system is that if you follow the Rothbardian ethics and the title transfer theory, et cetera, et cetera, what you're going to end up with is a few dominant firms, which are going to be absolutely massive and, um, and at best would just, um, exploit the consumer. That would be a, a, a typical argument. And then the others might go down the line, you know, they could become states, etc. We can get into that later. But assuming they don't, they would just have high prices, low quality, because they have just outcompeted everybody else. And it's basically impossible uh, to compete with them. Uh, so that would be the general claim. Now, I think that is false uh, for a number of the reasons. Um, firstly, what I want to do here is to outline uh, some major differences uh, that Ankapistan would have from the present economy and why I think that this is going to tend towards smaller firms on average rather than larger ones. Uh, so one sort of straightforward one is is the uh, prohibition of eminent domain and or what's called compulsory purchase here in the UK. A lot of large infrastructure projects and sort of land uh, acquisitions are basically done forcibly. Now, for the purpose of this thought experiment, I'm going to assume that there wasn't any eminent domain in the past. It's all from original appropriation as being conforming to Rothbardian principles. And so the compulsory purchase simply could not happen. And so these vast tracts of land, which you can forcibly remove people from, don't, doesn't happen. I mean, although this isn't really compulsory purchase because they were just kicked off, you have sort of things like the Enclosures Acts and things in English history. Uh, where you kick the pair to kick the uh, peasants off the land and force them to go into the towns and you get these large landed estates. They wouldn't happen. Um, with respect to pollution, uh, interestingly, uh, there would be more direct costs uh, borne by the polluter. Uh, Rothbard points out in his uh, essay in the 19th century, um, factories, that produced lots of pollution and dirty housewives uh, washing uh, were taken to court and they were fined uh, an appropriate amount and they had to in, it had to incur such costs on themselves. So a lot of these large organizations, which you could say has produced sort of uh, externalities of some description, simply couldn't exist in the same way. Uh, Tibor McCann, I think, makes the same point uh, with respect to sort of uh, airports and other sort of infrastructure uh, bodies because they affect negatively a lot of people in the area and um, you know the, the producers of them simply don't bear the cost of them and so they can be much larger and more invasive than they otherwise would be. Um, related to infrastructure of course you have the massive uh, state um, funded uh, infrastructure systems. You have uh, underwriting the insurance contracts for international shipping which would be much more expensive than it would, would be otherwise. Obviously you also have the free um, road network and interestingly I was listening to, watching a documentary of Errol Morris's on uh, Robert McMara and he worked for Ford for a, a brief period and um, he said that Ford didn't make a profit between 1926 and 1946. Now I don't know what all the other firms did in America at that time but it's certainly true that Ford would have done significantly better ever since I think it was Eisenhower if I can remember correctly built lots of roads for them because that's going to increase demand for their product. 
Um, and related to infrastructure in general, it means if distribution is cheaper, it means you can become bigger and spread out over a larger area than you otherwise would and reduce the natural advantage of small, more local competitors because they have smaller levels of uh, distribution costs. Uh, Joe Stromberg argues as well that um, a lot of the mass production in the US was only uh, viable because American foreign policy deliberately opened up foreign markets so they could basically sell the products to them because otherwise the systems that they were running simply were uneconomic. Um, so that's with respect to um, infrastructure. Um, no intellectual property law now. Rothbard argued for copyright. I'll take the Kinsellian position, which is sort of the modified Rothbardian position. There's huge amounts of money to be made in concentration and restriction of competition that comes from uh, patents and copyright, which restrict entry. Uh, the greater the cost of entry, the bigger you have to be to cover those costs, which then increases the average size of firm. So in the absence of those, you're going to be having smaller, small firms. No state regulations, uh, obviously be voluntary contract, but all these arcane, myriad, huge telephone directory books of um, regulations that stop uh, competition simply wouldn't exist. Um, in one instance in the US, a guy wanted to do a Segway tour and he had to take a quiz uh, and he thought it was really about health and safety, but it was actually about um, how much, question about the federal government. One of the questions was, how much land does the federal government own? Uh, and the options were something like 1 million, 5 million, 100 million with no units, which makes absolutely no sense. And so you have these absurd arcane things. I mean, if I said a, pro a proper business employee, people, I have no idea where I'd break any laws. I mean, you have to have a whole vast array of legal advice before you break something. And obviously, to have and to pay those people, you've got to be bigger. Um, then, of course, you know, oh, another thing, why is um, uh, legal services so expensive? Well, because <laughs> to become a, a lawyer or a barrister is massively expensive. Why? Because there's massive regulation, regulatory barriers to entry. Um, another point which should be different in uh, Ankapistan is no central banking. Um, and one with Roth, Rothbard is correct, probably based on gold. Uh, I mean, it is interesting when you, if you look at sort of wealth inequality, this is kind of what's tied into the critique uh, of, sort of the megacorps that come up is, is actually these vast disparities of uh, uh, distribution of income. Once the gold window is closed by Nixon in 71, ever since, you've had sort of free floating fiat currencies pretty much in 71 onwards. I know there's some exchange controls and stuff before they can get out in the 80s. Or the late 70s, you've had a vast increase of um, increase in wealth inequality. Well, why? Because people who get the money first can buy stuff before the prices go up and appropriate more resources to themselves. And if individuals become um, have a bigger difference in their incomes and wealth that they have, it's not a massive leap to think that the size of the organizations they could own would happen. Oh, and related to that, you know, cheap money created by central banks means it's easier to um, uh, engage in leverage buyouts um, uh, and borrowing to 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 buy out and uh, other organisations and to merge, um, and that'd be a lot more expensive probably because you haven't got all this cheap money around. So this cheap money allows the um, the merging of firms, um, which or the buying out more precisely, uh, which would be more expensive otherwise because the credit supply wouldn't be as large. Um, Limited liability would by contract only, depending on who you believe, you know, to what extent is the does limited liability going to insulate corporations from their um, from their actions. Carson thinks Kevin Carson thinks it's quite high Others like can sell, I think less so. But being able to sort of duck out and um, not be responsible for your actions in a certain sense of limited liability will be more difficult. You could do it by contract. You could uh, voluntarily do it, but that would be more difficult. Um, and uh, the fact there's no labor regulations and there's no sort of uh, um, restriction of who can enter, as I mentioned before, to some extent with the segue. Um, you know, you you're not getting unions to go, oh, no, we've got to increase the barriers to entry to stop competition with unionized labor. Uh, free entry would be legal in all, uh, all industries. And because of this, um, you know, I, I think that the, the firm sizes, you know, are unlikely to get as high as they are. I mean, some of the evidence Kevin Carson cites um, 
with respect to you know, like innovation, for example, it, most of the innovation doesn't actually take place in large corporations. It takes place in small organi- in small companies and on individuals because they're the ones who are risk taking. Typically, the large corporations are the ones who just buy everybody up once they realize, oh, this is a winner. We'll buy it up and continue with it. Now, of course, they do exploit it and they do market it. Well, that's true. Um, but they're not necessarily the fountains of, of innovation and growth. They're generally large bureaucratic organizations which operate very, very, very slowly. Um, so that's my sort of opening pitch as to why I think uh, Ankapistan, at least in the Rothbardian variety, is unlikely to be dominated by mega corporations. Tim, any thought? Everything you, what you just said, I more or less in theory agree with. I think in theory, anarcho-capitalism or the freed market, to use the Carson term, is the most pure of all uh, political, secular utopias out there. Um, even if you assume like some sort of a global Amish or global Mormon or a global Muslim theocracy, you still need an underlying economic and social, technical social arrangement to accompany it. Most of these don't have any direct uh, means of production behind it. And of them, I would say that, that capitalism and anarchism probably is most compatible and most effective and most productive. Um, in this review, I probably embody this sort of Whig view of history, but but it culminates in some sort of anarchism, not not um, some sort of progressive utopia, unless you view anarchism as a form of progressivism. Um, it has nothing to do with modern progressives. Um, one of my biggest problems is all the assumptions you've made um, in Rothbardistan, you could call it Rothbardistan, uh, uh, could could – in theory, I think many of the critiques you made about you, you positioned your argument in a very effective way. It's basically immune to having large corporations from emerge. Um, the only problem is here is that, you know, what would keep these sort of Rothbardian ethics in place? Um, and that, that to me is the, the thrust of the criticism of it. Um, in the current system, it is the state that is the biggest thief. And from my understanding of Rothbard, he basically calls the state a criminal gang, um, which, again, it is the biggest gang. And this is where this is where Chomsky, uh, Carson, uh, Preston, Carson, I said them again, um, all basically agree. Um, but then the question is, is being a gang leader rational? Yeah, it's rational to the gang leader. It may not be rational in the Socratic sense of the word. Um, you know, Socrates and the Mino dialogue thinks that people who do harm to others, um, and if you do doing harm and forming a mega corporation is restricting competition through uh, non profitable, non effective means, that's doing harm. And in the Socratic sense, that's that's harmful. But you know, Socrates gets executed, as everyone knows, and Christ gets executed. So, so whether or not, um, in that sense, Rathbardistan can be maintained, even if you start it off pure. Um, is of some question, and people can exploit um, the current system. Uh, you know, the old adage, the old act, Lord Acton adage, that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But this is again why I'm an anarchist. Uh, I think Bastiat has the line that the um, um, since people aren't angels, um, you you can't accept you can't expect them to put them in charge with the government. This is the anti this is to me the best anti Hobbesian position out there view. Um, so 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 as far as the individual things, um, I, my biggest disagreement with this, I don't think in the current mixed system, this is dominant in the United States, Britain, even Sweden, which is progressives um, favorite place to look at. Um, I don't think megacorps um, for most people are capital E exploitive in either the technical or in the feeling sense um, of the word. Um, this is something, Matt Brunig, um, he's sort of left-wing progressive in the United States, who's actually read Rothbard, Hoppe, and Nozick, um, has an article, of, you should, you, you know, complaining about complaining about small, the way small business owners get paid. And he said, you should work for a big business. Um, they'd be better. Um, I think progressives in the United States love big businesses uh, in, in Britain and, and so forth. They have a sort of two-way relationship with them. Um, so... Do I think do, do do myself as a sort of anarchist of the right think that I have a mixed view? Again, I have a mixed view on whether or not they exploit people. First of all, exploitation comes from Marx and this sort of technical labor theory of value, which again Carson buys in full hog. Walter Block has a great critique of Carson, um, and at times I think 
people like Keith Preston. I think most people who don't – Adam Smith, of course, buys into the labor, the to, how much you toil. Um, Adam Smith buys into that as well. So there's a sort of there's a sort of tension within Rothbardians between the labor theory value coming from Smith, coming from Marx as well. Um, so, so a lot of these, a lot of these things are premised on that. So, 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 so what's to stop? Um, so, so back to, I'm going to back this way. If you take the existing megacorps, I don't think Ford in general um, is as bad as Carson would say it is. Um, I'll take what I know, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, um, and this is just the current system, which is not pure capitalism by no means. Um, um, is it not pure capitalism by no means? This is not um, in Kapistan currently. Um, but did the did the Pennsylvania Railroad, on balance, um, cause more harm or prevent more harm? Um, if you want to use it in the sort of these sort of Rawlsian terms, which is, again, what we're sort of left with, I think on balance it produced more than it consumed. If anything, it, it produces positive externalities. And that's, that's where most of my argument lies, which is why I'm, a, I'm sort of a Friedman knight instead of a Rothbardian. Um, I'm not – as far as the rules you outlined, I, I – I, again, I'm going to go back to what's going to maintain the rules. So, Swithin, any comments? Okay, there's a lot to go at there. So, firstly, with respect to the railroad, I think it would be certainly the case you, that there are positive spillover effects. That's certainly the case. And whether you want to take those into account or not, legally speaking, is a, is a question of utilitarianism or not, or other forms of consequentialism. But let's just leave leave that aside. I think the issue is when you look at these large um, uh, organizations and um, railroads, etc., do exist and they have positive benefits which were not uh, originally seen uh, of, of the things it can, can facilitate. I think we have the problem here of the uh, Bastiat's uh, seen and the unseen. Well, we can see it's there and we can see all the good stuff it's got done and they go, oh, it must be good. Well, the question arises, well, what would have existed if it hadn't existed? If those resources been allocated other places, would it have been overall better? And that's a question which we can't investigate empirically. It's It's kind of quite difficult to figure out what would actually be the case. And in general, I think... Um, when you don't have these sort of large um, sort of land grants and things and these big sort of, I mean, easy obvious example here is like government uh, infrastructure building directly. You can see it there. You go, oh, this is really good. I mean, this is the defense that some of my students have made for the massive white elephant, which is HS2 in England and the UK, which is a high speed rail link, which is massively over budget. Uh, I think it's nearly trebled its budget since it was originally proposed. It's almost only a massive failure, but you go, well, but it's there. We've got this great infrastructure. Even if it's more expensive, it's there. We can use it. It's good. But the thing is, well, what could those resources have been used elsewhere? And the thing is, it tends to be quite difficult to see from a macro level because it's like these individual things that all these individuals have a little bit more money than they otherwise would have. And they spend it in a particular way that helps them. And you get these little incremental effects. And so it's kind of difficult to identify exactly what's kind of happened, but actually people are better off in that sense. Um, On to whether megacorps are currently exploitative. Um, they're less exploitative than the states to a large extent, I would I would say that. Um, I think most of the criticisms on the megacorps to a large extent does come on the employment end as opposed to the consumer end. Although that said, um, depending to what extent the megacorps had a hand in creating the legislation that was created, they are kind of indirectly exploitative. It's just they're not obviously exploitative. Uh, a good example of this um, is how the American large corporations supported uh, a similar sort of, I think, don't know what it was called in America, but it was something to the equivalent of the English Disability Discrimination Act. It was the act which may corporate uh, businesses putting ramps and all these accessible things for disabled people in wheelchairs. Now, you could say it's a good thing, fine, but if you look at the disparate costs, if you have a small office, and you've got like 20 people in there, you've got to install a lift of some description to get a wheelchair in. That's only spread over 20 workers. If you have a large um, office of hundreds of people, that's spread over a much smaller area. 
So whilst it's not helpful directly to the large corporation, it's making it more difficult for its competitors. And so whether mega corporations are exploited, I think to a, to a large extent depends on to what extent they're involved in these regulations which restrict competition. And that's not immediately obvious. Uh, this is, I think, with, with corporations in general. Unlike the state is a very obvious institution, they're kind of ambiguous because you could claim, well, they're just being dealt the cards that they've got. And at which point you could go, well, OK, fair enough. Um, although even in that case, you would say, well, have we got anything that's better than that? Um, but the ten- tendency is to focus on the employment aspect rather than the uh, goods that they produce. So, you know, do Ford exploit its workers or, or more classically kind of things like Amazon is the one to come in for criticism here with the pickers, for example. Well, I mean, do they voluntarily ex- uh, agree to work for them at those wages? Yeah, fine, fair enough. But the question is, the bargaining power that the workers have is much more restricted now because the um, opportunities for self-employment and small firms who would then compete these workers away from Amazon simply don't exist. And so, especially at the lower end, the amount of um, autonomy and um, in employment and things that these workers could have just, that just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm not saying all these, these uh, low-skilled workers would get paid vastly more in Ankapistan, but I do think that um, they would probably be able to have what they might think is more control over their own employment. Um, you know, women in the UK used to be childminders, uh, nannies, I think they're called in America, uh, and take kids in for a few hours. But now it's really difficult. You've got to go through all these educational uh, regulation systems and people just give up doing it. I've done it for years as an extra earner um, just because it, it's just too difficult to um, um, to do it, to, to pass all the regulations and things. I mean, uh, one of the ridiculous questions, because my mother-in-law did it, one of the um, ask, asked them, oh, what is your um, counter radicalization strategy for three-year-olds? <laughs> to which response is, they're three. Um, so um, the exploitation, I think, is not obvious. Uh, whether it's them themselves, I would argue from, say, a Rothbardian position would be a, whether or not they're engaging in, um, they are behind adding these regulations which are anti-competitive. Now, the most fundamental point which you raised is the question of how would Rothbardian ethics be maintained? And I think this is a question for any sort of political system is, how do you maintain a broad agreement on the principles of the system such that the system is stable? Because if you have a situation where nobody Everyone thinks sort of the institutions sort of, of law and sort of arbitration are illegitimate. The system will crumble. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could take the end of the Soviet Union as an example of this. You know, everyone's starting that this has ceased to be an illegitimate organization and it kind of crumbled. So the question is, how do we keep um, the the ethics um, of the sort of Rothbardianism? in so that pe- people will broadly follow it. And so when you come to court judgments, anything that's an infraction upon it will be struck down and um, appropriate punishment meted out. I think the best way of doing this or the most likely way of, again, you could say, would this ever come back? I think is, um, would be propagated by religious institutions. So historically in Britain being the church, um, uh, promulgating a code of sort of natural law ethics backed by um, God directly or indirectly. And this would be part of sort of like a common religion uh, of the area. Um, religion, hist- interestingly, is was, a t- I think, derived from a word which meant that which is shared. It was kind of like common sort of public custom because uh, Rome, for example, had that. You know, it was very religious in that sense of a people claiming although oh, no, Rome wasn't religious but it, it was you know had those public rituals which bound people together and obviously there's lots of sacrifices etc cetera, etc cetera, um, in Rome um, so I think if you had an institution like that which um, would have particular sort of cultural power then you you would be able to maintain at least broadly, a particular ethical system. Now, it need not necessarily be Rothbardian, but I mean, it is a means, I think, by which you could promulgate 
Rothbardian, or at least similar to Rothbardian ethics, or at least similar enough with respect to the things I've outlined to mean that megacorps wouldn't uh, dominate. Now, then the question is, well, how does that, how is that kind of maintained? Well, um, I would say in general, if you want agreements, you probably want to have, uh, whilst you might have a universal church, for example, different cultures in different areas might have slightly different norms. And so this is where I think sort of like a pan-anarchist position helps. You have relatively homogenous areas, uh, so agreements on more um, disputed areas. So the, probably the, the most classic one for that in libertarian disputes would be abortion. Um, if you had relatively homogenous areas, you had broader commitments which they agreed to, then, you know, that's kind of workable, at least in that area. Uh, now, then the question is you know, whether they'd be uh, invaded by other areas, and that's, an, that's another question. Um, but I think uh, you need um, an institution which has great cultural um, uh, power uh, to be able to kind of maintain uh, that kind of ethical belief. So that would be my response to your points, Tim. I think the first, the, I want to start off. In general, I think of all the political utopias I'm going to repeat, anarcho-capitalism is the most pure um, 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 and then simultaneously the most skeptical and most uh, utopian. Uh, I myself agree with largely with the Thomas Sowell tragic view or the Burkean view for that matter um, on human institutions and, and the ability to design them um, and execute them from that, from, from some sort of plan. Um, the problem to me with any sort of any sort of thick and this is a thick thin debate any sort of thick moral legal rule um, and this is the sort of the problem of panarchism in my view any any moral legal rule that is thick enough um, you basically want to become an evangelist and evangelize it to everyone um, and then you, and then this is develop what David Friedman calls the, the flat out I don't agree with Rothbard what do you do uh, what do you do with people who don't agree. Uh, and not to disagree over minor things. I mean, like disagree over major things. I mean, after all, after all, this. I mean, this is this is the whole. This is how you get the Bolshevik with the French Revolution, which is what Burke was talking about in the French Revolution. That you don't agree with the, the actual existing legal system. I mean, it's a sort of radical break from the current system. Um. Um. So for any sort of any third thick enough system. You know, it's just gonna. It's and it's a functioning. It's going to expand because it, it would. It should be true everywhere. Um, um, and, and this is, and if you want to talk about Christianity, I, I just stated, like, if Christian, it's so hard just to have Christianity true in this one corner of the world. That, that's a second order solution um, in a sort of tragic or fallen or a car crash type world. That's a second order solution, which I actually think is how the nations of Europe actually emerge as they existed, and as well as the United States. You've got to remember, it was a bunch of disconjointed states to start with. Um, um, you know, you couldn't. You can decide whether Protestantism or Lutheranism or Calvinism is correct. Well, Geneva can have Calvinism with Zwingli, and then Florence can have something else. Venice, that, 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 that's completely – that's okay. But then again, that's city-states. They still have a state. They still have one common um, 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 organization that functions as a state within them. Now, those are much more effective states to me um, um, in, in, in much more reasonable states. Um, now, I think there's a few anarchists that actually view that sort of ancient societies were actually more closer to anarchism than actual states. So the idea of a state is itself a modern idea. Um, and that's, well, that's another point. I think I should to, – to beat down the non the, – beat down the utopian criticism. It's actually the state thing is the utopian thing. It's not, it's not, it's not having no state or a seemingly stateless society. It's actually having no state is the older view. Um, um, so there's that. Um, as far as as far as um, as far as the people themselves, and you usually talk about well, if uh, take the take railroads, you know, what would people doing as an alternative? Uh, this is the this is again where I'm a skeptic of people. This is where I actually am a Randian, um, par excellence. Um, if you, you could actually say I'm a Nietzschean almost or a Napoleon. Um, Max Stern, after all, critiques Nietzsche's like of loving of Napoleon, um, and I think a lot of like. Founders of megacorps, not the second and third generation board members, not Joe Biden's son, not not the existing Carnegies. I'm talking about the initial ones, the ones that built the darn thing. Um, the ones that built the darn thing, they are like Napoleonic characters. Um, um, they are sort of, they are elites. Um, um, they are kind of ubermensches. 
in a way. The, and actually, if you look at the, how they constructed the railroads, they did require a military to build them. Many railroads in the United States required a military to build and maintain them. Um, and actually, they were used for militarily. Actually, in, in Russia, it's actually more explicit with the building of Russian railroad across the um, uh, Siberia. It's actually just a military project par excellence. And same with the interstate highway system, same with the German Autobahn system. They all had military uh, reasons for their construction. So, but again, go back to my skepticism. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of, as much as people like the sort of primitivist Amish worldview, most people don't live the primitivist Amish worldview. Um, Carson doesn't. Carson lives in an industrialized country. Um, whether or not you could have industrialism without mega corporations backed by states is some question. Um, um, but I'm not really sure how to answer that now. But I say as a foot test is people don't know what they want. And this is back to why I'm a Randian. It, it, this is where Rand, I would say that the corporations tell people what they want. Um, I don't think they manipulate them because I don't think people have – they might manipulate them, again, in the Socratic or the Christian sense, but they don't manipulate them in any meaningful way. I mean I think when most people go to McDonald's or who buy a, buy a new car every two years because the advertising told them – Kevin Carson has this has a section criticizing advertising, which I was sort of rolling my eyes while reading it. Um, it's like – yeah, true. You could argue that you know this. This reminds me of theologian Dallas Willard when he's sort of who I like a lot. He's you know making fun of uh, people. You, you want to look exactly like me with this new Corvette, which two million other Americans and people worldwide have. I mean, there's a sort of silly bourgeois nature to it. But again, most people like bourgeois consumerist habits. Um, you know, if anything, if the Soviet Union could have had the same bourgeois consumer style lifestyles only in the Soviet Union itself, which is the crony state market state socialism model. Uh, it was only the elites that were allowed to consume like that. In America, middle class people consume like the elites of most other places. Um, um, now, whether that's I, – I, 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 in the end, I'm not a third worldist. I think at times some of your critiques about intellectual property start becoming what Keith Preston or the Maoists would call third worldism. I do not think the West wealth is primarily developed through exploitation. Um, um, I don't, I, you know, as much as IP is a problem, most people in the developed world don't actually follow IP. I mean, I think they use a lot of streaming services and so forth. So, so as far as for the technical historical point, um, I will defend the West broadly. I will defend the megacorps as well because uh, they are part of the West. Um, they're a part of the West. Um, so yeah, so people don't know what they want. Megacorps and the Ubermenches, the original ones, again, not the 15th generation ones. They're just like the 15th generation monarchs. They don't want to be monarchs. Um, they don't have any clue of what's exactly. They, they sort of create what we create. I mean, I, again, as much as you might not like Steve Jobs or, and as much as, you know, you, you can't deny he had an interesting design of, and a product. Now he might himself not use it. But then this goes back to like what is truly human nature. I mean, I mean, if people if people want to spend all day day playing phones on phone games, I mean, maybe that's a bad thing. Uh, I actually think the recent round of technological information is largely much better than the 1950s, 1960s televisions and through three channels. I think I think late modernity, which we're living in this in the internet age, is much better than the so-called golden age of the 50s. Um, even though, as Sean Gabb points out, many people might have been technically more able to buy a house, um, um, but I do think there's more available certain other goods. So yeah, so so yeah, it is true that what else could be been built, um, but but the alternative is building nothing and just sitting around at home all day. I mean that's one alternative. But again, this is where Tyler Cowen points out that people like to work. Um, um, people like to work. People enjoy working. People enjoy consuming. Um, um, the primitivist societies that sometimes Carson talks about were very dangerous to the environment. Um, that's why they eventually they eventually run out of resources. Um, there's the, the myth of ecological Indian, um, and, and they, they sort of consume all resources to exhaustion. I think this is what ha might have happened on es Easter Esther Island or whatever it's called. This is Jared Diamond's example brings up. Um, so yeah, I I just don't. I just don't agree with the standard critique of mega corporations, which is why I think they will they, they could dominate they, or they could at least exist in some factions. Keep in mind, I mean, I mean this, this, this maybe is a question of what kind of people will make up in Pakistan. 
Um, you know, like people don't mind some forms of slavery, and you can find this historically. Thaddeus Russell wrote a whole book of all the freedom, a whole chapter called The Freedom of Slavery. It's worth pointing out not many slaves rebelled. Some did, but not many. Not many Russian serfs rebelled. Most people who work for Walmart and Amazon, even though they are pickers and they do get, I mean, but it, but although although the state just guarantees them through Obamacare and socialized medicine, um, so in a way as a whole package, they end up probably breaking even, if not coming out slightly ahead. They're not as much ahead as their owners, um, but then again, whether that they could ever be on that level is of some question. Um, so yeah, overall, I don't I don't I don't I don't agree with the um, I don't agree with like what what type of if they're made up of a bunch of like strong people who want liberty and independence and autonomy, yeah, then megacorps wouldn't dominate. But if you're willing to make a trade, um, or you don't know what you want, then I think then I think the megacorps have a way to start um, gaining gaining a market share, so to speak, even in the sort of perfect legal realm of no intellectual property, um, no of any of these all, none of all these uh, restraints, perfect appropriation. I mean, I, you could cause theoretically build a railroad in Kapistan that, like that. It, it could happen. And once it does happen, now you own the property. So now you're starting now, – once it happens, then you, then you can start really accumulating. Um, um, so, yeah, those are my, those are my counter th thoughts to what you said. Swithin? Okay, lots to hit at again. Um, so you mentioned, you know, uh, I was kind of tending towards third worldism and that uh, the West is purely exploitative. I wouldn't make that claim. The question as to why the West is rich, broadly speaking, in Paris and the world deserves a show of its own. Um, I would point, to, so even though I'd say the West is, so the system is broadly exploitative, I think it's kind of less exploitative than lots of the other systems, at least at present, in, at least in certain respects, at least with respect to its domestic populace. Maybe, no, maybe thing, not. Would, it, would, you, would you at least agree that at times Kevin Carson um, um, at times goes to that direction? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly Carson does. Yeah. Um, he, he, he wouldn't, um, I, Carson doesn't, say he's a primitivist although you could argue his system would lead to it but yeah uh, there's obviously things of great value produced in in the west uh, then that's certainly true um i think that's because our kind of legal code even how massively imperfect that it is is kind of a lot better than a lot of places although it's getting significantly worse um obvious points here i, I point to things like um in 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 the wise west um rich um iq differences to the rest of the world uh dis disparity in iq you don't get a you get a relatively more individualist society in the west from the from the saxon tribes than you say do in japan the east asians have higher iqs but they oh well, i suppose you know japan is kind of westernized but that's primarily because of western money after the second world war um differential um iq cer a certain level of individualism uh, i think christianity plays a part um it, with respect to monogamy i think creates a generally more uh cohesive society you don't have lots of unmarried men going around causing lots of problems because they're they have no social status etc um we could go into the great detail, but so there's lots of things the west gets right I'm certainly not, not a third worldist, uh, nor am I certainly not a primitivist. I would certainly also agree with you that the founders of firms are, tend to be sort of Napoleon type figures, at least to some extent. And they do produce things that people didn't know that they wanted. So a good quote from Henry Ford here is if you would have asked people, asked uh, businesses, uh, uh, how could we make uh, your your deliveries quicker? They would say, give us a quicker horse. And then Henry Ford said, I have the motor car. So a lot of people don't know what they want until they see it, see, see it. And that's certainly true. But I don't think it follows from that that you necessarily have a large and um, stable mega corporations. I do think you probably have quite a lot of people who are employed because I mean, there are many businesses. I think in Britain, small and medium sized businesses, um, large firms in Britain think from memory, according to the um, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is similar to the IRS in America, 
uh, say anybody who employs under 300 workers is like a small, medium sized company. Anything over 300 is considered large. Uh, firms uh, who employ under 300 workers each are um, can they employ 60 percent of the workforce. And that and that's excluding anyone self-employed as well. So I do think a lot of people will be employed because it's easier. You know, you get the paycheck, you turn up, you do your job and you leave. I think that's certainly true. But I would expect that there will be greater number of firms and so there'll be more choice over whom you work for. And so the wage rates would probably be relatively higher and the conditions would be relatively better. Um, now, you also relate to the primitivist point on um, kind of industrialization and anarchism. I mean, would you be able to have uh, industrial society um, with the kind of Rothbardian restrictions? Um, I think uh, yes, but I think it would look quite different. So with infrastructure, for example, I don't think you'd have predominant car use, at least not over a large area. Uh, roads would probably be worse to a large extent. Uh, some major routes were probably be well maintained. I mean, interesting, what got me thinking about this a long time ago was I was watching an old Top Gear episode, which is a car show. And in the South Island of New Zealand, they, in parts, they do not have tarmac roads. They have gravel ones. But it simply isn't economic for them to maintain them. And I was like, that makes entire sense. It's much cheaper to have more robust cars, like 4x4s, which can deal with the terrain, than to have uh really really immaculate roads which have relatively little use um related to that i think you'd have a lot more um air um travel comparatively simply because you don't need to build a railroad to fly you just need one place to go to and from now of course you've got the fuel costs etc and then you can go into you know where the what energy prices would be like but reading carson in particular I did kind of have an idea of trying to figure out, you know, what would the true free market price be? But it's so difficult. There's, there's, there's pressures in so many different directions to determine what that would be is very difficult. Uh, so I do think you would be able to get industrialization. Oh, and also, I haven't looked at this directly. Carson claims in certain, in, in certain industrial processes, there were small scale ones you could use in more sort of small sort of uh, houses or whatever. It didn't require large factories. Now, I haven't looked at that myself, but certainly with modern technology, um sm smaller production runs are possible now the question is you know, whether you could have got there is another question decide, but certainly with current technology i do think actually uh, i think mentioned with the episode of rick i do think with current technology we're ending sort of entering a sort of post-industrial phase of like working from home etc um because uh, the technology allows smaller producers and more remote less centralized workspaces which, of course, then, you know, would minimize, you would think, the preponderance of, of large corporations. Now, lastly, uh, to I think the most difficult question, which is, well, what do you do with people who disagree in Rothbardistan? Well, ultimately, uh, you kick them out. Um, if they become uh, a big enough problem, you just remove them. Um, this is the Hoppian physical removal strategy. I mean, that's ultimately the only option. If you've got somebody who is a permanent kind of revolutionary who wants to take down the system you know you just got to take you got to remove them uh, now, you might not need to kill them but you at least need to kick them out into a different jurisdiction which one might be more like preferable to their liking or i suppose eventually you know you, you might end up with a um like a not like a penal colony like a, a colony of um of um, malcontents where no one else wants to live because everyone else has kicked them out. I suppose that's possible. Um, but yeah, ultimately you would have to kick people out like that. I think Keith Preston has said that um, the um, Weimar Republic should have done something similar to the Nazis. It's like, well, no, you're standing on something which is um, subverting the constitution. Like, that's just working against the system. Like, no, we'll stop you. Um, so I think ultimately that's what's going to have to happen. So I do think, you know, focus on kind of non-aggression to a certain extent is uh, misguided. It's primarily about sort of um, just acquisition of property and transfer. So I do think you have know, to kick them out to different jurisdictions. Now, what I would say as well, is, you know, I was, I was saying about, you know, Christianity or other institutions promulgating ethics, etc. I do think that um, a most stable system 
uh, you're likely to get is you're always going to get elites. I'm, I'm not arguing for, when I'm saying mega corps won't dominate. I do think there's going to be large disparities of in, uh, income and wealth, but I don't think they'll be great as they are today. Because people are different. Some people are better at providing things that people want, and they're going to get more resources. Um, so uh, in a sense, I'm saying channeling sort of hoppy and natural elites. But I think in certain areas where people have um, a sense of belonging, maybe a certain city area or a county or whatever level, it would probably be relatively small. I think one possible model, which is kind of related to sort of pan-anarchism, you could get basically a council of elders who kind of go, OK, what is the appropriate kind of legal code? And then they then allow um, people to compete and provide the judicial services be- to based on that legal code. I mean, that's not too far away, really, from Rothbard stand, because Rothbard thinks, well, these councils of elders should just think of, you know, should be holding to the ethics of liberty. Um, and so even though I think you could have uh, like a culturally dominant force, I think that could be melded in a sense of a pan-anarchist system in which if the Council of Elders, for example, were to uh, alter uh, what they believed and in that area of kind of changed and so they could kind of change to some extent the, the, the legal code, that that could happen. So you would leave kind of Rothbard I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that Rothbard would exist forever or that there wouldn't be any bad people out there trying to subvert the system. I think they would. I just think... Um, you know, this is a system where you're going to hopefully have less subversion. You would where you have a dominant uh, state that has a monopoly on providing arbitration because they're always finding their favour. Whereas um, now, I suppose you could argue the Council of Elders would do that as well. So I suppose that is a potential critique. Um, and so it could go down that line. But I would say the caveat would be if you were to have this sort of a pan-anarchistic system, you could always leave. Uh, that does put some constraints on on them, and so it wouldn't really be a modern state in the the current understanding of the state. Um, but ultimately, if people disagree significantly, you just have to get rid of them, or you impose your will on them. I mean, that's ultimately the option. And I think Rothbard wouldn't. Um, uh, well, certainly Hopper would think that that was perfectly reasonable. So those would be my responses to uh, your your comments. Imposing your will on others. Um, uh, I think this is completely, I think the sort of physical removal meme is completely reasonable. Um, it is 100% reasonable. Um, it, you know, to the extent that the the counter to anarcho-capitalism exists, it's quite clear that there is physical removal in the existing forms of socialism. There's still jails in the Soviet Union. There's still jails in Cuba. Um, there's still jails in East Germany. If you could actually call the whole of East Germany a kind of jail, although it's probably not as bad as some people claim it is, but um, nonetheless, I'm not. I don't, I don't wince at the physical removal aspect. Um, um, but then again, the organization or people tasked with doing the physical remover, again, this is a this is a, this is a dangerous job for a variety of reasons. Since that because it, it gives you the right to um, um, take someone out or violate their rights or remove them. And once you do remove them, um, do they come back and try to destroy you? Now, of course, you can say, well, maybe, maybe could they could go build an army and go destroy them. Uh, maybe that's a possibility, um, but that's a possibility for any system. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think it, physical removal is a is a plausible strategy, and and, and in current society, um, progressives have no problem physically removing Alex Jones from um, um, YouTube um, or any other. Site. So as far as people who could cry about free speech for that things, they, uh, progressives physically remove people all the time from and actually progressive dictators, if there's such a thing as a progressive dictator, physically remove right wingers just as much as Pinochet and these other characters. They complain about it. Um, I think actually you know, I was recently watching uh, Peter Hitchens on Cuba with another guy, I think it's Tarek, and, and, and the other guy would never admit that uh, Fidel Castro did anything wrong. At least Peter Hitchens will admit that, you know, the Pinochets and the American Empire. As far as, I'm going to go back to the Carson, the, the Carson point about um, United States and third worldism, or the West broadly and third worldism, because I think Britain for the first hundred years was in the exact, the first hundred years of industrialization, actually probably Britain played a bigger role than the United States. It was actually probably better at it. In the Neil Ferguson argues this. I think Britain, the United States, in general, um, 
in general, on balance. And this is where I totally disagree with Keith Preston as well, Kevin Carson, as well as Chomsky. This is where I'm a Hitchian or a Randian, actually. Um, is basically the United States um, just uh, poops, literally, positive externalities. It's worth pointing out that, like, the United States was the United States was huge pressure valve, and still is, for discontents of all over the world. It still is. I mean, for, I mean that's how my ancestors got here. Um, that's how many people got here. I mean, the Puritans were, to a certain extent, physically kicked out of Britain. Um, um, the Northern Irish, there was a giant f- famine. Um, the Scots-Irish were originally Quakers. You want to talk about my ancestry or my one side of my family? Um, these, these were people that did not fit with the existing uh, norms of the society they came from. Um, actually, M- Mises... Um, I mean, if it wasn't for the United States, Mises was in Spain, or whatever Jeffrey Tucker, Spain or Portugal, looking for a boat pass to get to the United States. Um, um, many intellectuals in Germany, um, uh, Cornel Popper ended up in New Zealand, I believe, but that's part of the British West in my uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada are indiscriminate, full members of the British West, um, part of British dominions. Um, um, so, yeah, in general, I'd say we just. There's so many positive externalities. The, the biggest negative externality, I'd say, of American and Britain was the destruction of Germany, um, um, which I'm totally against in both world wars. wars. I, I'll even go with Charles Lindbergh and say the second one was problematic. But again, I, the biggest negative externality was World War, which we don't need to talk about at all. But again, I, I, I think that on balance, there's many more positive externalities. And if you take a Friedman and Raldsman view, you end up with the position of Pro West, and actually, what's interesting is some some progressives start leaning toward becoming supporters of megacorps like Matt Brunig, for example, which I find somewhat interesting. Um, as far as as far as to move to your other um, other points about uh, 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 as far as to move to the other points about Rothbard, I want to make a few final points about why I think Rothbard is. Um, in general, I think Rothbard's correct to identify a positive vision. Okay, so that I think is 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 a huge um, service. Um, um, but I don't. I think Rothbard runs into the problem that actually, interestingly, and libertarian anarchists run into the problem which interesting conservatives complain that the left has, which they do try to construct a utopia. But but here's where I'm going to circle back to an earlier point you made. In some ways, anarchism is actually the older idea than statism. Statism is understood today with the mass welfare state, the mass corporation, is the new idea. That's the more recent idea. Um, and as far as scaling back industrialism, and this is where I think, again, Carson and Preston um, are cultural leftists. And I use that term in a very technical sense. I don't think you get modern day, I don't think modern day feminism is maintainable unless you have mega corporations. So again, if you want to repeal back mega corporations, I think you'll have much more closer to home production. And home production will, by definition, because these are only people having children, according to the book, The Fundamentalist Shell and Her Air of the Earth, you will tend back to the sort of Puritan Amish um, style, Mormon style, which again, I mean, again, the women will do hugely valuable roles. I'm not an ant in that regard. Um, um, so yeah, I, I think I think a lot of the standard progressive or the standard left anarchist view on on what kind of society would replace it is 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 totally misguided because I think it would be in some ways it, it, it would definitely be mildly traditional whether or not it will be or an actionary is never a question um, the actual alternative we're actually doing back with industrials because I think the current idea is if you start cut, cutting down the megacorps we will see a cut down in production um, which in many ways I think is good and a positive thing. Uh, as much as people like Tyler Cowan point out people like to work, I do think people could, could go work less. But then again, what exactly do people do with their free time? The most likely alternative is the family life. And considering that in general, most intellectuals have a sort of at best neutral, at worst hostile relationship to the standard view of families or private organizations and private charities and private institutions. Um, I, I see them as sort of half-baked. Swithin, any comments? I would agree that um, a sort of Ankapistan is likely to tend slightly more traditional than uh, a the, 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 the current one. Um, just, you know, um, I mean, if you have more home production, it's the, the family's an economic unit. Uh, 
and uh, there's no welfare state, then the family as such becomes uh, much more important. And so, you know, leaders amongst the family are going to have more power. Uh, and you'll probably end up having the more towards the traditional um, sexual division of labor. And so I think that's certainly true. On to your point, whether you would have less production than uh, you currently have. Well, yeah, maybe <clears throat> in a sense. I mean, Carson argues, yes, you, you would have less. Although in a sense, there is the very thorny issue of, of determining what actually constitutes um, output. Because this gets into a big question of like, what is actually GDP, you know, what actually constitutes a service. Uh, I mean, a good is kind of relatively straightforward, but then kind of well, well, what's worth more. Um, I mean, you could argue, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. You can't have any more energy. So like, oh, we've got more value with the energy. But then kind of measuring that is kind of difficult. So to say whether output would be higher or lower is, is, is hard. Um, whether people would work more. I think people may work sort of, I think people would work on a similar level, possibly, I think, slightly less. Um, but I think they would probably have more control over what they do rather than um, being completely, having much less control over who their employer is and the, the nature and the style of their employment. Um so that would be my broad thoughts. And again, just to reiterate, this Rothbard, the standard and capital that I've outlined, I'm not arguing with a utopian. There would be crime, there would be murder, there would be rape, there'd be theft, et cetera, et cetera. And there would be, certainly at certain points, attempts at taking down the system and replacing it with something else. Whether it would withstand that, um, again, this is another maybe a question on, on like defence to some extent, which we could do another time. Um, there's ways I think it could, but whether it would all the time, well, no, not necessarily. I mean, all societies seem to get taken over by others at certain points. Um, but I do think it would be a significant improvement on what we currently have and would be, in principle, achievable. The question of how to get to there from now is much more difficult, which uh, would take a long time. Um, but those would be my... Uh, thoughts on that. Tim, any concluding remarks before I finish? The only okay. concluding remark I would uh, tend to argue is that if you're choosing between uh, bad options, the I I I'm almost gonna sound like a Randian because in some ways I am. I generally am sympathetic. I I understand working for I, as a person who's worked for two. I understand working for mega corporations suck. But then in this regard, I'm just an ancient Greek. I think all work in some ways sucks. I'm not a very good Protestant in this regard. So, I mean, I, I think there's a sort of fetishization of, of of yeoman farmers and small tradesmen that goes on. Um, I mean, you, you know, and I, I would also argue that one thing that tends to get forgotten about the megacorps is, and this goes back to the Napoleonic um, is like you take the 1877 Pennsylvania Railroad strike in Pittsburgh. Yes, there was a cut in pay, uh, but one of the, the actual driving factors was the Pennsylvania Railroad wanted to institute doubleheading. Now, doubleheading is actually a more efficient way to run a train, in theory. Um, there is safety constraints, but then again, this this goes back to the Sam Cedar versus Walter Block debate on perfect safety. You know, if 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 it was if perfect safety was relevant, we we wouldn't do anything. I mean. I mean, whether or not Monsanto's Roundup is safe or not is of some question. Um, but, you know, you know, perfect safety, again, is, is to me, in a way, unattainable. And so but, but there are certain ways in which 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 organized labor can actually be as parasitic um, um, as parasitic, if not more parasitic than the, the megacorps. And actually the megacorp ownership is the thing, the thing that looking out for the actual consumers um, that's a very sort of randy in insight. Um, um, and actually, this is this is actually the sort of charter school, private school insight um, in the United States. Um, I mean, I would argue that the public school teachers look out for themselves and the students are like third or fourth, if not a hundredth on their priority list. Um, um, so, I mean, I view public school Inc. in the United States or American Universities Inc. in the United States um, um, as a huge – 
um, uh, as a huge weight uh, around people's neck. I mean, if, if you want to describe it, I don't think taking the Bernie Sanders approach of nationalizing it um, is is a very productive thing. Is anything will get more of problems there. Um, so 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 in general, I do think the, the in in a way they're hated because they're they're labor entrepreneurials. They, they, they yes they do. If you take the labor theory or the Smithian theory of value, they do they might in a way steal some amount of labor production. But it's not clear that that them working by themselves they would be as productive um now they do get forced around and this is the one of the criticisms but then again as an overall package do people choose it most people choose to live i mean again we can see that people immigrate and they don't have perfect choices um but then i don't think perfect choice like perfect safety is is attainable so yeah i i I, I'm much more agnostic than than you or Sean Gavin and many libertarians are when it comes to big business. I will not go to say the Randian line that they're ex, the big businessmen are the most exploited minority. I will not go that far, but I I, I do think there is positive benefits to the to the mega corps. Although I can see why people hate them, but I think work itself sucks. Um, um, so so I mean a lot of that is just work sucks, and you know you either the two main worldviews are evolution and Christianity. Christianity, ground is cursed. Evolution is we're just living in this car crash and we've had to get over this Malthusian trap. If you break your leg and you're a hunter-gatherer in some primitive society, there's not going to be an MRI machine. There's not going to be... I mean, again, if you get certain diseases, you're just dead. And it, there's certainly not going to be a lockdown in a primitive society or a feudal society. Not a feudal society, a Gilman farmer society. And many of these things would not exist, as well as feminism in all likelihood. Maybe some mild forms of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I view a lot of the critics of half-baked. So Rothbard is the most pure of all these sort of utopian political systems. But that still is problematic. Swithin, any final comments? Uh, my final point would be I do think you get Napoleonic figures uh, who found organizations who have great, great sort of firms and they could dominate. Um, but as you pointed out, their children aren't necessarily uh, the best and most productive at maintaining um, those organizations, especially in the absence of intellectual property and things like that, and they can be easily copied. I just don't see that dominance maintaining over a long time period. I think you could get peaks of it, but if you look at over a particular time period, I don't think uh, you would have it at least not to the same extent as we have at present. I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for listening. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, please um, subscribe to us on YouTube, on Podbean, on Spotify, and share it with your friends and family so they can listen to it too. And if you have any ideas for the show or any comments you would like to make, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com.